All right, we're back again with another interview uh, in reference to the tornado of May the 27th, 1973. Uh, as, in the, as what we've done in the last couple of weeks, uh, in interviewing different various and sundry people who were affected by the tornado and uh, just kind of get a, each person's perspective because everybody seems to have a different story and a little bit different and yet some of them have the same. So today we have John Meggs, Dr. John Meggs, who if anybody lives in this community they're familiar with who you are. <laughs> and uh, so give us, just tell us a little bit about how, where you, about your growing up time, because you grew up in Bibb County. So tell us a little bit about your history prior to graduating high school, let's say. I grew up here. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm... A part of the Meggs family. Yep. Your dad I'm, was who? Uh, Johnny Meggs. I had drugstore in Brent. He uh, Actually, my grandfather started that drugstore in 1916. And... Uh, when he got sick, Daddy had been a pharmacist in Tuscaloosa, and so in 1957, uh, Mother and Daddy moved home to Brent, and Daddy sort of took over the drugstore uh, as my grandfather became more ill and eventually died. Now, you, it was your grandfather on your mother's side, yes. though, right? Yes, yes. Because she was a hunt, is that yes, right? correct. Okay, and so it was actually hunt drug, is what hunt we drug. were told. Hunt drug. After the tornado, when we rebuilt, uh, he changed the name to Brent Drug. Okay. okay. It was always confusing for folks because there was Meg's Drug uptown Centerville. Oh, yeah. And then Hunt Drug run by the Meg's in Brent. So <laughs> that was just so we could confuse people. <laughs> That's right. I bet it worked. <laughs> <laughs> so you remember as a child growing up in that drugstore even, because it was your grandfather's store, so you, I'm sure you were a part of, of just being a part of that. Well, the drugstore was rebuilt in 66, mm -hmm. about the same time Brent Baptist Church got rebuilt. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I remember uh, the old drugstore, the old hotel, the Hunt Hotel that uh, my grandparents ran uh, for years, and then um, the drugstore, and then in 66, the drugstore was rebuilt, which was the 50th anniversary of Hunt Drug, since it was founded in 16. Uh, so... Um, they built that store and then got to do it again in 73 after uh, it was gone with the wind. And your parents were Betty and Johnny, right? Correct. And where was the home that you grew up in? Uh, it was there on High on Main Street. Um, I was going to say Highway 5. I think now it's Highway 25. But uh, pretty much across the street from uh, what's now the what do they call that now? The Save More or... Oh, the, okay. The grow, right. the, and it was next to the hotel, Southern right. Bell Motel. Uh, we grew up next to the swimming pool there. That Your mother and daddy was living in that in 1973? They yes. were living in that house? Yes. So what kind of damage did they have in that particular house? It gone. The whole house? So it didn't... So what you see now, the brick house that's there now... It was a totally different house, is that what you're saying? Yeah, that was a house that was rebuilt after the tornado. What about the neighbors down the street? If you were to go down the street from that house toward the church, were most of those gone as well? Most. Uh, the James house next, right next door to us uh, was not blown away, but then it burned a week later. Uh, apparently from some electrical damage that occurred um, I think it got rearranged a little by the storm, but uh, uh, was not blown down, so it uh, burned. And then the the other houses uh, on down the street were gone. Was that Preston's family, Preston James? Uh, it's day? that family. Preston didn't live there. That Nail James and Bill Daly, um, you know Daly James yes, Hardware. Yes. Uh, that was where they lived. Okay. I think I remember that now that you say that. I'd forgotten yeah, that's I was were. trying to remember. Um, right now I'm blocking on Ms. Daly's name. Uh, this is a test. <laughs> <laughs> see where we all are. Yeah, see we? where we are. <laughs> but now, okay, let's go back to the main part of Brent that was hit. Uh, 
your mom and dad were at the church they at were. the time. Can you tell us a little bit about what that was like? Uh, were you at the church as well? I was. Okay. So let's go back to the day, May, May 27th. 27. And what we've heard from everybody else, it was windy, it was murky, it was not, it was an unusual feeling day in the afternoon. It was an unusual feeling day. It was something strange about the atmosphere. It's, it's hard to describe, and back then we didn't have uh, weather radar, we didn't have James Spann to watch. Uh, we, uh, you could just tell something's not right. I mean, mm -hmm. it was a... Um, so a heaviness to the atmosphere, or, or it just felt unusual. Mm -hmm. um, but um, it, I mean, it wasn't raining, it wasn't storming, uh, and but it just an unusual feel Maybe to the about day. Kind of uncomfortable. Yes. Was it a a normal amount of people who came on to church that night, or was it? A slim crowd, I'm assuming, because they were concerned about weather a little bit, maybe? Actually, it was a pretty good crowd. That was Dr. Walker's last Sunday. He His, was interim, is that right? He was our interim. We had just hired a, uh, or called a new pastor. Uh, the pastor, David McGowan, had actually just moved in um, the week prior to the storm. Uh, and then he was in the National Guard, so I think he was gone to guard camp, so he wasn't there. His belongings were there in the pastorium. Uh, and Did he have a family? Did he have, yes, he had. Were they uh, home? Uh, no. Sure? No, they weren't there. Okay. Um, they had, even though they had moved some belongings, they hadn't actually moved in. I got you. Uh, so his, his first Sunday sermon at Brent was when he preached on the slab the week after the tornado. Really? <laughs> uh, the, um, I forgot where I was going with the story, but anyway, the... Um, Walker, you said, was there that night. You asked about the crowd, that's yes. right. But we were going to have a fellowship that night, okay. sort of a going away party for Dr. Walker. Um, Dr. Walker had just bought a new car from Daily Fawcett, uh, and that's part of the story of uh, him determined he's going to get that car that night after the storm, which didn't work. But uh, um, so we we had pretty we had a good crowd, and thank goodness the tornado hit between Training Union and the worship service. It hit at seven twenty-five. So the Training Union had just finished. Everybody were coming into the sanctuary for the worship service, um, and well, then they began to tell people to take cover? Well, they were they were told to go down to the fellowship hall, which the closest thing we had to a basement. Uh, there were a few people left in the sanctuary, um, but and, uh, one interesting story, uh, as Mother and Daddy and the, his training union class were coming out of class uh, about the time the tornado hit. Um, and I forgot exactly where their classroom was, but it was in that in the educational building upstairs. Uh, and when the building started caving in, um, Daddy thought he grabbed Mother uh, to protect her uh, and covered her and it was Miss Catherine Ward, and uh, <laughs> Janice told us about that. <laughs> so that was your dad. That, that was that. Daddy, and then so and Miss Catherine said, "Well, thank you, Johnny." <laughs> Everybody was looking out for each other. <laughs> yep, that's right. So that was an interesting story with them. Now, I had been at home. I came. I drove in uh, for church. I didn't go to training union, and I had gotten there. I don't know, a few minutes before, and was standing out on the porch of the church, and you could tell the weather was getting bad. I mean, it was getting dark and windy, and then, and then when we saw this big black cloud coming up Highway 5, uh, you know, I didn't see the traditional tornado that I think of, it was just this big black mass 
uh, coming up the highway. It was it covered up the hole. It was wide. I mean, it it was not a little funnel, mm -hmm. uh, and we knew we better get inside. Uh, somebody had already, I think Dr. Walker had come and told the folks in the sanctuary to head down stairs into the fellowship hall. Uh, Andrew Mitchell was older, didn't see very well. He didn't make it. Um, he was the fatality when the mm -hmm. church fell in. Uh, he had gotten up to about where the organ is, and I guess the wall fell on him uh, there. Uh, but now the church now has a, had steps going down each side. So at that time, it had steps going down by the organ and down by the on the other side as well. So he was there trying the, to get down the there. The stairs were down on the organ side. At that time, on the piano side, uh, you sort of went out and then down the current bi level steps to get into the. Oh, okay. To the. Uh, but so people were ball. going from both directions. More than likely, to get more there. than likely, because there, there were just three or four people in the sanctuary: Mr. John Oden, uh, Andrew Mitchell. Uh, you know, Mr. Oden, he was fortunate when the building fell in; two pews fell together and sort of made a tent with him under it, and he he came out with a broken collarbone, uh, whereas Mr. Mitchell lost his life. Um, Did a wall fall on Mr. Mitchell, or was it mm, okay? Yeah. You were headed. I mean, you were. In, you said earlier you were a freshman in college, so yeah, this, you weren't anywhere near becoming a doctor at that time. Oh you no. Still had some years to go. But yeah, I was eighteen years old. Okay. Were there others in the congregation though that were uh, skilled as far as medical? Linda Hammond was a nurse. She was she, there. Did she get to him or who got to No, I mean, when we found him, he was deceased. Too far? Yeah. Well, we understood. We've, we've had, I, well, we talked to Phil and we talked to Steve, and the understanding we got from them was that Linda Hammond rode with them to Perry County. No, just, just told them what to do. She was, yeah, she was, in, she was down there in the fellowship hall. The, the injuries I remember were Faye Dowdle, uh, Mac Lee Croy, and Pauline Hunt. Yes. Uh, Pauline Hunt had the damaged leg. Faye uh, Dowdle had the very damaged leg. Um, and they both, Phil and Steve, they, one of them, they each took one of them in the back seat right. down to Perry County. And Mr. Mack, I think, had he had Glass. laceration to his mm -hmm. scalp. Mm -hmm. And Linda was treating that uh, down in, I guess, on one of the tables in the fellowship hall. Uh, so y'all were fortunate to have her there. Uh, just to tend to those who are injured or to assist yeah. in some way, let people know how to help. But it must have been a bit of chaos going on. Oh yeah, well, I, as when it looked like, I think you told me you ought to talk to Ann Murphy, but I yeah. do remember um, when we were standing out on the porch and Miss Ann coming out saying, ooh, we're gonna have some bad weather, I gotta get home. <laughs> and I had worried about her for 40 years about it. where was she when this thing finally hit but I have come to find out she told us 10 years ago that she actually never got out of the parking lot right uh, but she had gone on the porch she'd ran and got in her vehicle about the time uh, the storm hit so um, I think Jerry Powell was out there I'm I'm thinking perhaps Eddie McMillan uh, and then Mr. Manus Cottingham and I and there were some children in the we were in the in the vestibule, I think they had been waiting maybe for Mama to come pick them up or whatever. And um, Mr. Manus grabbed one of the children, and I had the other two. And um, as we went through the vestibule into the sanctuary, I saw Mr. Manus immediately dart to the left. And then uh, when I went out of the vestibule into the sanctuary, about that time, uh, you start seeing the stained glass windows pop, and it looks like the uh, windows, I mean, the wall was shaken. Um, I did not see the roof come off. I was, um, when I saw that, we sort of dove down under that back row of pews. Uh, we were fortunate in that the balcony overhang uh, protected us. If we'd gotten further into the sanctuary, 
uh, we would have been injured as well, but we were under the overhang from Phil the balcony. Or somebody said that this was more, like, more steel reinforcement on this front area that didn't fall in as compared to what really did fall in? Well, the, the steel frame that held the steeple, uh, you know, that you can tell what did not mm -hmm. collapse, but then, you know, just your masonry walls on the side, you know, they fell in. They, they didn't uh, have the same support. No. Hmm. Uh, and, the, and the roof, I think the roof ended up sitting over in the parking lot next to the pastorium. Uh, there was a, I saw that picture. Well, you see right here, right. you know, the, the walls are gone. I mean, you've got the, you got the, the baptistry in the back and you got the vestibule in the front, but the main body of the sanctuary is gone. So in relation to that picture right there, where were you at that moment? I was, in, under I that was, um, yeah, I, I was under the back row of pews, which was protected by the balcony overhang, which was supported by the, uh, the steel framework that held the steeple. And others there with you? Manus Scottingham and those children. So you had the children right there. Oh, gee. And then that must I have think been traumatic for them. I think Jerry, I believe Jerry was still in the vest. He. He was in the vestibule. Okay. I might have to ask Jerry to be sure, but I think he was. Mm -hmm. I don't I think, think y'all interviewed Jerry, didn't you, David? Yes. It, it, it seems to be that everybody has a, a real good recollection of the things and the events and where they were and who did what because it's apparently burned into their mind in such a way they wouldn't never forget it. No, I remember, you know, you know laying... You know, we we laid down when I when we saw the mm -hmm. you know the glass is just popping out and then the the walls are trembling and you you lay down and then you just feel all this debris. Um, they waited till it got out before you know you look up. Uh, it was a little light. Mr. Manus always described it as it sounded like cannon shots. I didn't hear any cannon shots. <laughs> to me, it sounded like I was standing between two railroad tracks with trains going by on both sides. Ugh. It was just a a loud roar. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, that's, uh, and I guess Mr. Manus' cannon, cannon shots were either, that's when the windows popped or when the walls mm -hmm. fell or, or whatever. But I, mean, I always remember, because he and I, even though we were, 15 feet from each other, we had a different recollection mm -hmm. of the sound. Uh, but right, when you when you wake up from that, or when you get, when you are alerted that you look up and you see everything's gone, what are you thinking about where your mom and dad is, and and where people might are they are you looking at that and thinking there's got to be people trapped? Well, I knew when we came into the sanctuary. I didn't. There weren't. I didn't see anybody. Mm -hmm. uh, and apparently, John Oden and Andrew Mitchell were the only two that were actually still in the sanctuary. Uh, and but I didn't see them okay. when we came in. And then, but my attention was drawn to the fact that the stained glass windows just exploded. Mm -hmm. uh, so I wasn't taking a whole big survey of what else is going on. Uh, but you. And then, but I remember standing up. And, you know, getting up after the storm, after the tornado passed on through, and you know the roof's gone, the walls are gone. You you stand up, and I'm looking straight out in the parking lot because mm -hmm. there's no wall anymore. Mm -hmm. And I remember there's a car horn going off. Uh, I guess the storm somehow set off a, a car horn, uh, and that's I remember that sound. I remember. Uh, just a constant blaring of a car horn. And uh, then it's, it's a little, immediately after that, it's, it's a little, that's where my memory gets a little bit confused, but I do remember um, a few, some few minutes later, we, um, found Mr. Mitchell 
And I mean, I knew Mr. Mitchell, but you know, couldn't recognize him. He was buried under a wall, and as we, you know, dug him out, and and he was elderly. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. I, I don't know how elderly, but he was elderly, um, and he he didn't have good eyesight. Mm -hmm. I think Kenny Brown may have been the first one to find him. Kenny had been there for. I don't know why he was there, but he was, mm -hmm. uh, he normally goes to church at Randolph, but he was at our church that night. Probably some of his, his kids were there or something, maybe. Not well, his kids. Yeah. No, I guess not. <laughs> he was younger than me. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> maybe he was there with a the girlfriend. Well, or there with a, with a you know, where the yeah, youth choir was going to sing. Yeah. Uh, 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 it was part of, you know, Dr. Walker's farewell. Yeah. Uh, but... And I remember getting Mr. Mitchell's wallet out of his back pocket just to see who he was. Uh, and then we, you uh, um, then somehow we made it down to the basement, to the fellowship hall, sort of checking on folks. And then um, sooner or later, got up with mother and daddy. Um, Jack and Debbie were there. I mean, we knew all. I think mother was sort of beside herself till she knew where we all were. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, she was she knew where daddy was because um, he was Miss Catherine Moore. <laughs> <But>, uh, <laughs> the what did she know where Davy was and Jack? And all, uh, well, Debbie and I think I think they were downstairs because yeah. they were part of the youth group, and so they had been directed. Into the okay. fellowship hall. I was one of the latecomers. I've been standing out on the porch talking, <laughs> waiting on uh, the storm to get there. Waiting on well, I mean, just waiting on church to yeah. start. Uh, I hadn't. I had not gone to to training union to mm -hmm. Well, you started to tell a story about the the new pastor or the pastor that was just leaving about getting a new car. Arthur Walker, Doctor Walker was the. Uh, religion professor from Samford, who was oh, okay. our interim pastor. This was his last Sunday, uh, and he had bought a, a new Dodge there from Miller Daly. Uh, and uh, after the storm, you know, you you know, trees were down, telephone poles were down, you know, you, you, sort of, you were sort of trapped, and then later... Um, Somehow, um, Lonnie Raglan had come from his house down what within was the bypass, down Highway 5, and come back around because you couldn't go towards Centerville. That was completely blocked. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we got in the back of that pickup, Dr. Walker and my family and, and, the, and Billy Joe and her family, and uh, we went to her house uh, it's sometime or another while we were I know Uncle Aubrey was worried about Aunt Pauline uh, trying to figure out you know he knew he, she had been injured and he was trying to find some way to get her taken care of uh, you know you thought you know the hospital here was closer, but you, you get there was there. no way you could get there. Mm -hmm. uh, so they ended up, the Cottinghams took she and Miss Faye down to Marion. Uh, after that, somehow they got that road cleared and couldn't get it cleared the other way. Uh, but I remember folks walking, uh, his brother Dunlap, if you remember Brother Dunlap, uh, maybe he'd been at the old Southern Bell restaurant. Mm -hmm. And I guess after the storm, they were seeing what you could see, I guess. And when I saw him out front of the church, and um, he said, I remember him saying, your house is gone. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, um, you know, because I was, you know, asking about, since he'd come from that way, you know, well, you see Mother and Daddy say, your house is gone. <laughs> uh, and... Uh, and then when we did leave, and you know, the drugstore was gone. So, you know, we lost a house, a car, a church. I mean, a, 
a house, a store, a church, and three vehicles. What about your uh, grandparents? Were they still living then? No. Okay. Karen, can I ask you my question? Okay. <laughs> Dr. John, I, I've heard something that seems to be common with the eyewitnesses that we've interviewed. And I think we're going to be calling our brochure and our website Brent Tornado, The Daytime Stood Still. And from everybody that I hear, including yourself, there's a, there's a sense that everything had changed so dramatically that, you had, that people tended to have kind of a concept of a loss of the reality of their lives. They didn't know where things were. They didn't know where home was. They didn't know anything. And there was a sense that it just kind of froze them in time. And uh, I'm sure that must have been a common sense that most of the people that went through this felt that nothing was ever going to be the same again and that they were disoriented and couldn't get their questions answered, couldn't find uh, the things that were normal, the, the, like, like a sense of time. I've heard people say that it seemed like it was an hour, but it probably wasn't but three minutes, you know. Uh, do you think that was probably a, a, something that everybody had in common? That's one question. And another thing is, I sense also that there, if there's anything that good came out of all of this, uh, I sense that a sense of community uh, was was bound into that event that made these people um, have a commonality and a sense of family much deeper than most communities. I know when I first came here, the people in Brent, Alabama seemed to have a more uh, uh, heightened sense of community than uh, anywhere I've ever seen before. And I, and I think that's a good thing. Well, I do think folks were trying to, I mean, it sort of looked like there was a, a common loss. I mean, it looked like total destruction. I mean, from from where, from there at the church, uh, you know, there, there was almost nothing left standing. I mean, you just, uh, it was just just gone. And, and I, had, I had, you know, reports that, the house was gone and things, you know, up to that in that direction. And then south, um, we saw some of that. I mean, Billy Joe didn't have to take us home with her. Uh, but, uh, I mean, I don't know where we'd have spent the night if, if she hadn't. Uh, now, after, well, actually, I did not spend the night there. That's another story if you want to hear it in a minute. But... Uh, or it finishes another one I half started before. The mother and daddy ended up staying with his brother in Centerville, uh, Uncle Perry and Nate Doris, where they lived over in Daly Subdivision, and they stayed there. And we eventually moved into the the little what we always call the little house, the house behind mother and daddy's house. Oh that, yeah, that is still that's there it's, now. It's still yeah. there. Uh, they had there was a couple. Wish I could remember that. I hate to call the name because I'd probably get it wrong, uh, but I think I know who was living there. But they were young. That ended up being sort of uh, young couple's honeymoon home. I mean, that's yeah. where they first get married. They live there for a little while till they do something different. Yeah. Uh, but then they, after they moved out, we transitioned there. I went to summer school that summer because I had a bed in Tuscaloosa. I didn't have one in Brent. <laughs> And, Make use of that one in Tuscaloosa. <laughs> I mean, I had a place I didn't, I mean, that little two-bedroom, four-room house uh, that, uh, you know, it was, when we were three years old, it was one thing, but then when we were uh, 18, 17, and however old Jack was, uh, it was a little bit different. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, that's, that's where we lived until uh, I think it was probably into... November before they moved into the house that's there now. Uh, and anyway, the when we got to Billy Joe's, Dr. Walker was bound and determined he was going to go get his car and he was going home. Where was home for him? Birmingham. Birmingham. Um, and... 
um, he would he was not going to be denied. So uh, <laughs> Regan and I walked with him from Billy Joe's back to the church. This was after we'd gotten out, we'd gone around, we got to her house, uh, and then... Was it dark by then? Oh, it was dark. I mean, this happened at 725, yeah. and uh, was it daylight saving time or not? Yeah. I don't remember, but it it's dark, because it's 9, 10 o'clock. Oh. Cause I'm thinking we're about midnight when yeah. we get back to the church, you know, my second trip. Because on the way back, walking from her house to the church, I stopped at our house. Uh, and yeah, it was gone. And mm -hmm. uh, it, it, I described it like a dollhouse. Mm -hmm. The roof was gone, mm -hmm. and the front wall was laid down. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you could... You could see back in the bedroom, sort of. And you could right. see the living room, dining room, you know. There were things that, you know, table and chairs sitting there just like normal, and then the other stuff was gone. Yeah. Uh, and I remember um, remember taking something off of bedside table in my bedroom and said, well, I stuck it under the bed to protect it. Well... It was raining, and the carpet soaked up all the water, and I ruined some. I'd just been better off I'd left it alone. <laughs> but uh, um, anyway. So you were walking back in the rain to find that car? It did. Mist and kind of. It, was, it had pretty much quit raining then, but they, it, did, it did rain yeah. some. Um, anyway, when we got there, his car wasn't getting out. <laughs> we had told him, your car not getting out. When he got there. Your car not getting out, and I, and it had suffered a little bit of damage. It wasn't destroyed, but I think he eventually did get his car. Uh, but it was maybe a couple of weeks later. Uh, so then, um, when you went back then, you know, the, if there had been cell phones, you know, cell towers were down. There was no communication. Uh, there was no nothing. So I do remember when I got back to the church. There was a reporter there from the Tuscaloosa News. I had gotten Dang there. I, I don't know, but he was there. He was on, and you know when, you know we show up, and you know we, and well, you know we, yeah, we were here. And so he starts <laughs> asking us questions about it, and uh, and so I think. A quote from me is in the Tuscaloosa News the next morning or the next day when they ran the paper. Well, um, I'm saying uh too much, but anyway, the at least for me, an interesting story. I had a date in Tuscaloosa on Saturday night, and which a lot of times I would spend the night, then I'd drive home, come with the church, and bring yeah. Well, the storm happens. My girlfriend and her family, you know, they don't know. You know all they know, Brent, Brent's been blown away. Mm -hmm. you know, they were curious about, you know, well, I got blown away. And so I'm, she, she told me later, but, well, you know, so you get the Tuscaloosa News, and there's a quote from me on the <laughs> front page of the Tuscaloosa News. So that way she knew I had survived. Yeah. Uh, a newspaper's good for something. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, and... So anyway, we walked back to Billy Joe's and Dr. Walker was determined he was going home. So there being a congregation at Billy Joe's house and not that many beds, uh, Regan and I drove Dr. Walker to Birmingham. So we were about midnight. I think we got to his house about 2 a.m. But you were a something. teenager that didn't matter. Yeah, <laughs> he was a teenager. Uh, and... You know, his wife didn't know about, you know, what, no. so, you know, she didn't know what was going on. Yeah. She just been sitting on the news where Brent had been blown away. So, uh, so we took, took him home uh, and spent the night there at mm -hmm. his house. And then the next morning, <laughs> got up and drove back to Brent. Must have declared martial law or something, but um, when we were coming back, into town, they were, you know, blows were rock, roads were blocked. 
uh, didn't want to let us in. We had to go to the National Guard Armory and get permission from Colonel Daly to get into Brent. Uh, so I, I do remember remember that part, but he knew us, so we, we were legitimate to be, to be getting back into Brent. Susan uh, told us Sunday, I was just quizzing her a little bit, because she and Matt were, that's, she was Susan Patrick Clark, she and Matt were at the beach waiting for, who to, who'd she say was supposed to come down to the beach and meet them? I can't remember exactly, but anyway, they were at the beach, and when they heard about the tornado, they came up the next day to check on her mom and dad, and they wouldn't let her come up Highway 5, and she said, you don't understand, my parents were up there, I got to see about my parents, and so they... They let her yeah. through, but yeah, it, it must have been so. Well, and also Janice told that she was living in Daly Subdivision, and their power went out, and she was headed over there to see about Miss Catherine, and they couldn't go that way. They had to turn around and go up by River Bend to get around to the church. Yeah, you couldn't. You couldn't go down anywhere. It sounded like yeah, um, highway. Well, I guess it's twenty five now, but it yeah. was five and twenty five then. The you couldn't yeah. couldn't get that way. I mean, we had we had to walk it. We walked it, uh, and I do remember the that week. You know, we did a lot of cleaning up, trying to salvage what you can salvage. And I remember getting a little aggravated at the at the gawkers mm. that were coming by to see mm -hmm. see the damage. You know. I, um, Phil said that, and he said that he has made a point of now when we have tornado damage and all, not being one of those that runs to it because he understood how yeah, how they get in the way and they're mm -hmm. you know and you're what well, I mean you know you're coming to watch the freak show I mean mm -hmm. so um, yeah I'm like that too now when there's like when the tornado the most recent tornado that uh, hit Centerville. That almost followed this path, but mm -hmm. shifted about a quarter mile. Uh, I didn't for several weeks. I didn't go because mm -hmm. there are folks trying to clean up over there, and there's damage, right. and they don't need me sightseeing. We had uh, the advantage because we live on Antioch, going up the four lane. You, you, if you went up the four lane on 82, after that one you're talking about, you could see everything over there where you couldn't see everything before. All the trees were gone, yep. so you could tell how much devastation was over there. But yeah, I guess it's just a natural thing. People, you know, want to go see what happened. But nowadays, with the news coverage we have, you get all you could possibly see on the news. Yeah, I feel sorry for the folks in... Um, Mississippi? Yeah, I'm trying to... Rolling. Rocky Rolling Fork or Rock Rolling, Water? Yeah, that, something like that. That town in... Sounds about a lot like us people. Yeah. now that's not there anymore. Well, and that's a good point. If you've been through what y'all went through here, see, David and I weren't living here then. We were, we moved here in 78, so it was five years before we moved here. But we even had a sense of how people responded to weather that we just kind of would look back and why is somebody freaking out about weather? Because we hadn't been through that, you know. But once you've been through that, you have a whole nother perspective of what people are going through and makes you, uh, you know, just sympathetic to what they're faced with. I remember that summer, when I was back at the university, walking across the quad, and there was a thunderstorm coming and a loud clap of thunder. You know, I had never been scared of the weather, but I jumped pretty high when I heard that clap of thunder that, that particular time. And it's a traumatic uh, event for people. Uh, it truly is. And still now, what I love about it now, when you can, with the weather radar, and I know my geography, I know where I live, and I can turn on the TV before the power goes out, and I can, you know, whether the sirens are going off, or not, I'm in the safe zone, or I'm not in the safe zone. And uh, We had re one recently, was, which was actually after that one that didn't touch down, uh, the, the one that touched down a couple of years ago. Then bad weather was coming through and uh Farrah and the kids were all at the house and me and Farrah and the kids well me and the kids were in the closet Farrah's outside of the closet and he's on they was on the porch watching the weather <laughs> and uh you know you just 
you do what you can, and, and hopefully you can watch them and, and take and cover at the right time. Well, Kelly was in Tuscaloosa when the tornado that hit that Tuscaloosa, yes. I forgot the year, but... Uh, 11, was it 11, 2011? Somewhere along in there. Like anyway. It was this century. Yeah. And I remember Kelly sending us a picture of the tornado that hit Tuscaloosa, you know, standing out in front of her place. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's like, why are you outside? Get inside and get in the bathtub or get somewhere, get somewhere safe, you know, because. Uh, you knew what she was faced with. Yeah, because that tornado ended up going, you know, probably a hundred yards from where they were. I mean, they no damage. They were safe. But uh, that, uh, you know, you have a little bit of a healthy respect. Uh, now, if, if, you know, we get in the. Well, if they get on a, uh, an indoor room, small room on the lower floor, and so that happens to be the girls' bathroom at my house. So if there's a bad storm, we're worried about it, you know, and trying to keep the animals in there and behaving when you're in there. <laughs> but, uh, they don't know what's going yeah, on either. But that's what we tend to do now. Well, I'm going to ask you one more question that was asked. <coughs> Excuse me. Actually... <coughs> This was one we asked Phil, and I didn't expect the answer. Well, I should have expected it from Phil. But <laughs> well, if you could have, if you could, how did we ask that? If, if you could change something about the way it is now, what would you change? Phil, Phil said, it was his comment, I'd go back to the way it was before and have it look just like it was before. But, you know, that's, that is emotional because that's where your memories are. Yeah, well, now when you drive from, when you get at at the Y there in in Brent across from old Walmart, uh, where I guess it's 58 and, or 5 and 25 split, whatever it is. Um, when I grew up, that was like going down University Boulevard in Tuscaloosa, all the trees over mm -hmm. the highway. It was, I say it's either like Government Street in Mobile or mm -hmm. University Boulevard in Tuscaloosa. You know, tree-lined streets and uh, the houses, uh, you know, now. Uh, Just barren. It's barren. When you got, and you got telephone poles on. Mm -hmm. Back then we had poles on one side of the road and they shared the electrical power and telephone power but then after the tornado phone company's putting up poles and the power company's putting up poles and you've mm -hmm. got this ugly looking so we most of those pictures actually got saved uh, but uh, anyway for my birthday my girlfriend I got a new Bible <laughs> so I didn't get a Bible. You still got that one? Yeah, I was looking for it. You still got the same girlfriend. No, I do not. <laughs> no, I do not. <laughs> We're going to <laughs> No, I do not. <laughs> Thanks, John. It, is a bit, it really has been, David put me into doing these interviews when I really wasn't prepared for. But it's fun to sit, hear everybody's perspective being just a, sh just a little bit different. Just a tiny yeah, bit. you know, you could probably, as you stir up memories, I could probably tell a whole bunch of other stories. But uh, um, I, <coughs> I remember something about where we, um, I'm not sure when the coroner actually got to Mr. Mitchell, but uh, uh, that was, he was the only death there at the church. Mm -hmm. Um and thank God, I mean, because literally, if this storm had hit 10 minutes later or 10 minutes sooner, mm -hmm. uh, there'd been a whole lot more casualties. Uh, Did you know the other people who lost their life in the community, the Mr. Green? and I knew Mr. Green. Um, and There was a young girl, 13, I think. I, I don't know that I knew. I think there were five people that mm -hmm. were killed. And that's something about the pictures. We've been trying to get pictures of them, but most were gone in the storm in some sort of way. Yeah, uh, it's. But your your world gets. I mean, your 
reduced. I mean, you fill can't a box. Yeah, fill a box and uh, put that in put that box in Uncle Aubrey's shed and um, go back to the university. <laughs> well, I, I I had few things. I had there. a few things there. I mean, I had a good fair number of clothes. But yeah, remember the sh the shoes I was wearing on the night of the tornado were. They were a sway like a sort of like a hush yeah. puppy. Uh, they sort of got ruined as they got wet. Sure. But, uh, uh, huh. but at least I had a pair of shoes. Though. Anything else we hadn't said, David? You wanted to cover? Oh, I talk too I'm, much. I'm very appreciative of the folks here being willing to come out and revisit their memories. Even though some of them may not have been pleasant memories, it's been hard on some. It's folks. Uh, it's clear to me that uh, the things that happened there did make a bond in a community unlike any bond I've ever seen anywhere else. Yeah, it, it, that's true. I mean, I, and I guess after fifty years, the bond may not be as strong now as it was, but for those first. 20 years or so, it was quite a bond, I think. Well, I guess if, if my hope is that what we're doing and what the city of Brent has decided to do in, in doing this 50 year uh, commemorative look back, uh, at least the generations coming on will have everything that we know about it from eyewitness interviews. Uh, and that's about as good as we can do, but they, they may have a wonderment as to why it was so important to the generation before them but there were some significant events that came out of all of this. And um, the bond in the community, I think probably one of the strongest, most valuable things that I see that probably came out of it. The town was gone and never gonna be the same again. I, I can see that, but something else replaced it. And that was the bond in the community, I think. Uh, what is the, uh, you? What is the plan? What, I mean, what are we, what are you doing? We're doing a uh, magazine and we're also going to be putting together a website so that uh, the name of the website is BrentTornado.com and uh, it will have the interviews, it will have content from the magazine and hopefully in the future people will be able to contribute even more if they want to, if they were an eyewitness, a place where they can Tell and you, are you are you going to include the Brent tornado that David Thrasher did? Those older those old we pictures. We'll either have it in there or have references to it. Yes, sir. Because I still will occasionally go back, and it's hard. There's a there's one picture I keep trying to find again. It's a it's a perspective at the church that you know some of these pictures you know you've seen, but there was one I saw somewhere and I can't find it where it was. Uh, anyway, it was a different perspective of the of the church where you could you know see how this was a mess. Uh, I have more pictures. I'll let you look through them. The but there's the drugstore. Mm -hmm. There's a couple of picture other pictures um, that. Uh, and somewhere in those pictures, of there's a picture of uh, of mother and daddy's house that, you know, I guess this picture and this picture are the two most common ones you see right. of the church. Uh, are you going to put all these pictures in that magazine? Or? I'm going to try to put uh, everything <clears throat> I've got up where people can see it. I know what I didn't mention while I was going to mention. If it hadn't been for the Salvation Army... We well, I meant to, you know, I wouldn't have anything to eat that mm -hmm. Monday after the tornado. We were, um, or maybe it's, I don't know, anyway, they set up in the parking lot of the service station uh, there in Brent and uh, had hot dogs, I think it was. And, but they, I wish I could remember the... Major, whatever his name was, I can't remember his name, but a super We've had nice guy. Mentioned the Salvation Army and how much they and they. A couple of people said how they take note when the Salvation Army is collecting now because of what. Well, I, I know it was a, I know it was a <clears throat> tragic event, and I, I guess um, you, you can stand and look at the tragedy all the time, but 
I tend to think that there's probably some good to be found in it. And uh, that sense of community, I think, is a good thing that came out of it. Another good thing that came out of it, and I haven't mentioned this to anybody before, but there was a man there that came in to help out, a young man at the time, named James Spann. And something happened to him in that... He uh, claims we, we made him be a weatherman. Well, thank God for that, because... Uh, Said his career. John, what happened is, this man apparently had a fire in his belly that said, if there's a way that you can notify people better, then we're going to do it. And he has done it. He has set the uh, standard for not going off the air during bad weather. If there's a bad weather event in their viewing area, he may, and he, I think he had some battles to do with his superiors over that issue. Because you remember people didn't used to do live weather Forecast yeah, and until until the warnings are gone, he's, they say they interrupt programming well, and they're there. Like I heard somebody say, he said, if you see James Spann's suspenders, you probably ain't going to have a, 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 the same number of chickens you had before. <laughs> well, the we've invited him to Brent for the weekend. Well, if but, anything good may have come out of that tornado, James Spann's commitment to doing better weather information for the people of Alabama, I think has probably saved innumerable lives. Because I know when when there is bad weather, I want him on the TV and I want to see the map. <laughs> yeah. That's right. That's exactly right. And I can, with the weather radar, with the way they do it now, yeah. you know, I can see where the storm it, is. It would be hard to be terribly surprised if you just got the TV on, wouldn't it? Yeah, the, but then... You know, then when the power goes out, then you're back that's in the right, old days. But right. uh, anyway. well, that that that's a good thing. That and he was a he was a ham oper radio operator as a hobby. That's a good thing that came out of the Brent tornado. If anything did, I think more lives have been saved because of his experience and his commitment to to to, to himself and to God. I suppose that he would do everything within his power not to see that kind of thing happen again, where people don't know what's coming. You ought to interview him. I got him on the schedule, Dr. John. Going <laughs> to be interviewing him tomorrow night. <laughs> going to be glad to have him. And I'm going to ask him about that. What what happened to him? And Made uh, him have that... Uh, and I have invited him to Brent that weekend. Yeah, well, uh, that's great. That's great. And he, yeah, and he said he would. Will. Well, he said he was coming. Yeah. But we got to figure out what we're going to do. I think the town's doing something on the 27th. And then whatever we do at the church will be on the 28th, which is the Sunday, because it's Sunday. And the but Hopefully we can cover that. That'd be great. Thank you. Thanks for taking time. Appreciate you coming.